Father, we do thank you so much that you are a faithful God, that you are a loving God. We thank you that you are also a just God because I can't imagine going to heaven and still having the, the curse of sin. Father, but you're going to take all that away because Jesus Christ took all that away when he died on the cross and rose again for us. Lord, help us to remember this year that it's not about us, it's all about you. It's not about the things that we do or the failures or successes we have. It's all about our heart being focused on you. And help us to remember when we do fall short, Lord, to get up because we're already forgiven. That you give us grace and grace and more grace. And we just thank you for that. You are a loving God and we bring glory and honor to you. We just thank you for so much that you would send your son to die for us and then you would empower us with your spirit to walk through this world where we're not alone. Help us to realize the power that is inside of us, especially as we talk about today uh, in your word, the power of the seed that we have sown in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. No, you're fine. So the sermon is called Picking Weeds. Kind of hard to do when there's a couple feet of snow on the ground, isn't it? But we can talk about that. And you know what? We don't pick weeds, okay? So if realize this first of all. There was a farmer, okay? Matthew 13, 1 through 9. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat, sat in it, while the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying... A farmer. That's not you. That's not I. That's God. He went out to sow his seed, the Word of God. And we'll see later where, where this is explained. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they were withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. It's not your job to pick weeds. It's not your job to live a holy, righteous life. What? It's Jesus' job through you. You have to die to yourself. You have to die to yourself. You have to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after Him. If you've been trying in 2016 to do this thing under your own power, then you're probably frustrated. And I don't want you going into 2017 with that frustration. Jesus says give it to Him and He'll carry that load. So quit trying to carry any load that you've been carrying for 2016. Just give it to Jesus. He'll carry it. God doesn't look at you if you are a Christian, if you've been saved. He doesn't look at you through your mistakes, your failures. He doesn't look at you through your successes. He looks at you through Jesus Christ because we take on His righteousness. As the song says, when His blood ran wet, red, we were washed white as snow, period. From that day on, nothing matters about what you've done. Now, that's not, Paul's clear about that. That's not an invitation to go sin all. It's an invitation to say, man, how much do you love me, God? And I want to give my life, as Paul said, as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable act of service. Not because I am justified by works of righteousness, but according to His mercy and grace I have been saved. And I want to show my love. I want to tell others so that they can know of that same love. Because Jesus died for me, a sinner, just as He died for whoever else that is a sinner. Their sins are no worse than mine. Their sins... I don't want to put condemnation at anyone because I am a sinner saved by grace. If it wasn't because God loved me so much that He would send His Son, then I would die and spend an eternity apart from God in hell getting the punishment that I deserve. But because of His grace, no matter what sins I have committed, I am born again as a child of God if I simply have faith in Jesus Christ. And if I do, my life's going to be different. And if I'm still holding on to some of the weeds that I have in my garden, I need to let him pull them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you notice, Jesus ends the passage in, Who has ears? Let them hear. If you look throughout the New Testament, you'll see Jesus tells that several times. He told it in every letter in Revelation to the churches. Not to those that were unsaved, but to the church. 
And he said, let those who have ears hear. Five out of the seven letters were not that nice to the churches. They said, here's the things where you're doing wrong. But you know what? All you've got to do is stop right where you're at, turn back to me, and I'll pick those weeds out. I'll give you the soil that you need. I'll take you back even when you've locked me out of your heart and I stand at the door and knock. I'll come right back in of the places that you've closed me out of. And I especially want to mention this because this is the beginning of a new year. We think about New Year's resolutions and things we can do to make our lives better or things we need to take out of our lives or whatever the reasons are. All we need to worry about is putting Jesus 100% into our heart and then He'll do the rest. James 1.22 in the NIV says, Do not merely listen to the Word of God and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. The NLT version of that says, But don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. So many times we listen to God's Word, but after we've heard it, we still say, I'm not going to go forgive my neighbor. I know that he says that. I know that I'm supposed to love my enemy, but I just can't do that. You're right, you can't do that. I know that I'm saved by grace, but I still feel like I'm not good enough. Yes, you are. Because Jesus was totally good enough. He died in your place. You have been justified completely, and it is God's will that you live a sanctified, holy, and set-apart life. You can't do it on your own, so He sent the power of God Himself in the form of the Holy Spirit, to live inside of you. But He needs all of you. He doesn't need those closed doors of your heart. He doesn't need that disobedience. Because see, when we have that disobedience, we kind of turn out like the first thing we see there. We have a hardened path in our heart. Because all these times we've told Jesus, no, I'm not going to do that yet. I'll do anything, but I don't want to do that. And I can speak from experience. I've told you time and time again. My life didn't change much in my acts of service when I became pastor, but when I said, okay, God, I'll give you whatever. I'm tired of saying I'll give you this, but not that. He just opened himself up to me. My life changed dramatically. Was I saved at that point? Oh, no. I've been saved, and I've had my highs and my lows. But at that point, he just revealed himself to me like he'd never done before because I said, I give you all, Father. And he said, let me show you a little bit of what I want to give you. God loves you so much that he let his son... (coughs) come to earth to be born, be placed in a feeding trough, to live a life where people denied him, cursed him, mocked him, spit at him, beat him, and nailed him to the tree. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And he also said, it is finished. It is complete. I have paid the price. I have ransomed those back who will choose to believe in me. There's no other way. There's no other thing that you can do or not do, all you've got to do is believe in Jesus Christ and nothing can take that away from you. No powers in this world, no powers that we don't know of anywhere else. We are saved once and for all, covered by the blood of the Lamb. Whoever has ears, let them hear. James 1.22 out of the Net Bible says, but be sure you live out the message And do not merely listen to it and so deceive yourselves. Maybe you didn't catch that, but each way that it was said, it says if you listen and don't carry out the words of God, if you don't follow in the footsteps of Jesus, when he says come and follow after me, then you're deceiving yourselves. You are hearers of the word and doers only. And there's a good chance that that knowledge is fine up here, but it's not here where it matters. So we need to let our hearts be softened. We need to let Jesus come in and do some picking of some weeds, add some nutrients to the soil, do some watering, whatever He needs to do to make that soil where it's productive, where we bear fruit. Are you deceiving yourself in any way? If you can sit here and say that you aren't, we probably need to ask that question again. Are you deceiving yourself in any way? Because we're all guilty of it. We have something in our life, like I said, that we're holding on to or we're not good enough about. That's why I said it with the talent surveys. Oh, I can't do this. If Jesus is calling you to do it, first of all, be obedient. And second of all, watch Him give you the power that you never knew you had because the power is in the seed. 
And the farmer gives you the seed that you need to produce, the fruit that you need to produce for his glory and his honor, not for yours, for his. To draw others so that they see that fruit and feed upon that fruit and so they know Jesus Christ. So they come to a personal relationship with God. So that they are justified and set free from the penalty of sin. So maybe you think, well, I'm pretty good. I'm in pretty good stance. Well, let's just look at Matthew and just go through a couple chapters and see how you go. Okay, we'll have a little test here. In Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time on Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Have you changed your way of thinking? Or do you still rely on yourself? Do you get up each day and say, Not my will be done, but thy will be done? Every day? Do you take up your cross, well, no matter what it takes, and follow after Him? Have you given up those things you know you need to give up, but you keep holding on to them? Okay, let's go a couple verses. Matthew 4, 19 says, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Uh-oh, we're getting worse already, aren't we? How many people have you told about Jesus this week? Really told them about Jesus, what He's done in your life, <laughs> with the point of telling them so that they know Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be fishers of men. But instead, we fish for fish. We fish for things. We fish for praise. We fish for peace. That's a great thing. We fish for family. But are we fishing for people the way we're supposed to fish for them? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Oh, wait a minute. Let's skip the Beatitudes because we know we're going to fall short there, right? That's unfair. Okay, we'll skip them. <laughs> Matthew um, 5.11. This is still part of the Beatitudes, but I'll, I'm just going to read this one and give it to you. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. I know that you guys are good there. Whenever anybody makes you mad and says things to offend you, you just are perfectly fine with that, and you say, bless you, brother, right? Okay, so I know you're good there. Let's go to verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What about when they're not looking, when somebody's not there watching you? Are you still glorifying your Father in heaven? What if they saw those deeds? What if they heard the gossip in the background after you were through with them and you said, can you believe they said or did that to someone else? I know you're not guilty of that. Chap uh, Matthew 5 verse 22 says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Well, we've talked about that. I know you all forgive your brothers every time something goes wrong, right? I, I know you do that. Verse 28 says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery within her heart. Let me tell you this, I am an adulterer over and over again. Because I have looked at women lustfully in my heart. I'll admit it if you won't. And I still have a problem with it. When you turn on secular t TV and you see models dressed, barely dressed, not hardly dressed, then you have a hard time, don't you? And you can turn that on when you want to watch the news and the commercial comes on. So you're going to be affected with it whether you want it or not. You might not be looking at pornography or anything. You might be not guilty of that. But what about, like I said, when you see that model come on TV advertising panties? How do you feel? Well, I can tell you this, the closer that I get to God, the more I think that that's somebody's daughter and I want to tell her about Jesus. The more insulting it is to her. The more I think how pathetic men are because they breed on that. Jesus loves everyone. We don't need to put up with that kind of garbage. It's 2017, let's not. We don't know what we're going to face this year in this country. Oh, we don't know. But let's stand firm in our beliefs. Let's let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. You want me to keep going on or did something hit, a, hit you? I figure I've got most of you. And I didn't. Not my words. I just read the Bible, right? So don't say I'm pointing fingers or anything else because it got me and probably every one of them, if you want to be honest. So what do we need to do? Whoever has ears, let them hear. What does that mean? That means don't just listen and not do anything. We're clear about that already. We've got to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. We've got to take that to action. And Jesus pointed it out. He said, listen up, guys. This is what I'm trying to tell you. 
If you'll follow after me, you'll have life abundantly. Not only will you be born again, but you'll start living the kind of life of the kingdom of heaven here now. Because the kingdom of heaven has come. That's why you need to repent and change your way of thinking. Jesus also said in Luke 6, starting in verse 48, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was built well. Well, I'm not going to go on further because I don't want to be the one on the shifting sands. I want to be the one who has my foundation firmly built. And I need to see exactly what that says. It's everyone, you know, regardless of who you are, what you've done, what you haven't done, everyone who comes to me hears my words... Hears, who has ears, and puts them in to practice. Not just hearers, but doers of the word only. And you notice in here, the first question is, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Do you call Jesus Lord today? Or is he just somebody you'd like to know? Do you know him? Do you know him personally? And if you know him personally, do you call him Lord? If you are, are you coming to Him, denying yourself so that you can come to Him and follow after Him? Are you hearing His words and putting them into practice, obeying not part of them, not the ones that I can handle, but especially the ones that I can't handle? Because again, that's going to show me the power of God, the power of the seed when I read His Word, when I trust in His Spirit, when I pray to Him. I will see the power that God has the one who spoke and created billions of billions of stars that I cannot even fathom. I can't fathom the power that they produce. I can't fathom the space that they cover. I can't fathom any of it. But I want to say that he doesn't have the power in my life to help me quit smoking if that's what I need to do. Or whatever it is. And I'm not saying smoking is a sin. You decide where God is calling you. I'm not saying that at all. It's January 1st, like I said, a time when people make New Year's resolutions. Have you made any? Have you thought about it? And if you have, have you made them with God? You know, losing all the weight in this world and getting healthy, that's a great thing. And you should do things like that. That's the bigger, biggest New Year's resolution. Lose some weight and get in shape. But don't forget about your spirit. Jesus said that we need the bread of life, which is Jesus, which is the Word, more than we ever need nutrients. It's not going to hurt you to go without some physical food. We can go quite a, a while. But every day that you go out without the food of Jesus Christ in your life as a Christian, you're not living to your potential. You're not seeing the power of the seed. You're letting things choke it out rather than living a life that brings glory and honor to God, a life that others will see and make a difference. So who are you living for? What is life anyway? Is it, were we created just for our own pleasure? I mean, we can look back at scriptures, we can look at everything else, you can dive into the prosperity gospel. Jesus wants his children happy, yes. But you're not going to find the hope, the love, the joy, the peace, unless you have Jesus. Unless you're relying on him to give you that power. You might have some peace when things are going great, but you won't have the peace when you're being persecuted, when you don't have things, when your family and friends have turned against you. But you will have peace if you let Jesus be the center of your heart. You will have peace no matter what, because you know that even though the world betrays you, God is faithful and just, and He loves you enough to purchase you back at the price of His only Son. That is amazing. When you just concentrate on that and meditate on that, how could God love me that much? What a wonderful, wonderful God we serve. Well, whose life is it anyway? Well, let's look at Romans 8 and see what it says, starting in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
Those who are in the realm of flesh cannot please God. You, however, if you believe in Jesus, if you've accepted him into your heart and you're born again, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. That's why we have to walk by faith, not by sight. That's why we have to quit living a life for me, but living a life for him. That his will be done, not my will be done. If, indeed, the Spirit of God does live in you. There's a question to comp contemplate. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But you know, the positive thing here again is all you've got to do is say, Father, forgive me, and he will forgive you and start afresh. Whether it's the first time that you ever accepted Jesus Christ or you're coming back to him and opening up that door that you had closed in your heart. Either way, he's faithful, he loves you, and he's waiting with open arms. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. His righteousness, not yours. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, as a result of whatever you want to say, brothers and sisters, brethren, Christians, believers, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, not by you, by the Spirit, not by your power or your might, because you will fail miserably. But if you give the power to the Spirit to God, you will live. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And I've said it time and time again. I, I say it, don't complicate it. Keep it simple, stupid. That's not to be offensive. It's just a phrase people say. He is our Father in heaven. I love my Son no matter what He does. I only have one. I praise God that I have Him. I love Him unconditionally. He is my Son. Nothing will change that. If you are God's child, He loves you unconditionally. Nothing can take away the sonship or daughtership that you have. God's only Son died so that you would have it. He's not going to let anybody or anything take it away. Wow, the peace and joy we can have knowing that. James 1.22 out of the NLT said, But don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. We read before Luke 6, verse 46. It says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus also says again, why do we do something, Lord, Lord? It's in Matthew 7, 21. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. These are the people that are calling him Lord, Lord. Not just the people coming to church. Not the people saying, Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I, I'm in a Christian family. I'm, 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 I live in the United States. Of course I'm a Christian. No, this is people who are living a life that you say, Way, hey, wow. Look what they're doing. But they still don't know Jesus in their heart. They're living for works of righteousness or whatever it is. And they're missing the point that they don't let Jesus be the center of their heart. So today is a new year, a new beginning. It's a time that we should think about it. We should do it every day, but we have a chance today to start afresh. It's the beginning of a new year. It's 2017. You'll keep writing 2016 for a while on your checks and stuff till you get used to it. Let's get used to living for God in 2017. Or do you want to play games? Do you want to live an abundant life, the life that Jesus died for for you to live? Or do you want to keep dealing in some of the misery and sorrow that you have? because you're not giving it all to Him. The choice is up to you. But He is sitting there waiting and waiting for His children to act like children of God. Matthew 13, 1 says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. That same day, well, what does that mean? We need to look at chapter 12, don't we? We need to see what was going on in chapter 12, because it's the same day. So in Matthew chapter 12, the last few verses, starting in verse 46... While Jesus was talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside, wanting to speak to him. 
Someone told him, Your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting to speak to you. He replied to him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, those who had forsaken all, he's already sent out the twelve and everything and followed after him. He said, Here are my mother and my brother. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother, brother, is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus is pretty clear. He doesn't call you just to believe in him and not abide by his words. We are to be hearers of the word and doers of the word, period. We have a position. We are ambassadors of Christ, living in a foreign land, telling others about Jesus and the reconciliation that God wants to give them. Not judgment and condemnation, but mercy, love, and grace. And that's our job. So the farmer went out to sow his seed in Matthew 13. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came up and ate it. Some fell on the rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, most of the time when we read this passage, we sit here and say, hmm, which one are the ones that are saved and which ones aren't saved? Hmm, no, well, I'm not that one. I'm not this one. You know what? When I read this passage, I'm every one of them. I can say it. Let's see, the weeds that choked my life. Oh, there's been plenty of them. There's been plenty of times where I've worked for family or for things more than I've ever worked for God. I said, I'll do this when Jacob is out of the house and going to college. God was calling me to do it here regardless and maybe it would have taught my son more of what he was trying to teach him there's been plenty of times where let's see the soil wasn't that deep and when it sprang up the heat came and it burned up we're not looking to see if this person saved or not saved but there's been plenty of times in my life where I prayed and prayed and prayed and things didn't change so I walked away from God saying why aren't you answering my prayers what about the hardened path? Surely that doesn't apply to us. Every time that I tell Jesus no, that I tell the Spirit no, I am hardening my heart where His words aren't getting in. I'm stomping down that path where when I read His words, they're not as effective to me. So I'm guilty of every one of these. And there's only one soil that I should want here whatsoever. So we don't need to talk about the others. We need to talk about the good soil. How can I make my heart good where God's word penetrates, where I see his blessings? Does that mean my life's going to be easier? No. But that means that Jesus came like he said so that my joy might be complete. So that I am doing the will of the Father. So that others see that. They see it. It may take years, right Dave? It may take years of praying, but then we see something. We're not supposed to walk by faith for X amount of time. We're supposed to walk by faith through this life. We may see the answers that we want to see. We may not. We may see them when we get to glory. But what matters is that when we get to heaven, God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I guarantee he's going to say, my good and faithful son, even though the verse says just servant. Because we are his children. He's going to love me and embrace me as his child. And he is going to, to praise me for what I have done. Now my sins will be covered. Everything else, I'm not saying that. But read your Bible about rewards in heaven and everything else and see, see what you come up with. I want to please my Father in heaven. I want to do his work. Not because I'm obligated or anything else, but because he loved me so much. So the only kind of soil I want to have is good soil. So that means that some weeds probably need to be picked out of my life. So I'm going to examine that today and I'm going to try my best to give them and start afresh and give them to Jesus. He's already defeated them all anyway. There's probably some places where my roots are shallow in my faith. I'm going to ask God to point them out and give them to Him today. I know there's some places too where I've said no in my life and I've packed down that soil. I'm going to give it to Him today. And I pray the same for you. Jesus goes on to say, he explains it. 
But he don't, you don't need it explained. You have it right there. You see. Like I said, we try to muddy up the water by who's this person or that person. When all these apply, all I want is to have good soil to what in verse 8? Where it produces a crop. And it's not up to me whether it's 100, 60, or 30, or 2. It's up to him. And that will come more and more with my obedience. The more that we give to him, the more that he gives us. The word says that if we ask in his name, he'll give us the desires of our heart. That doesn't mean things. That means his will. So many times when we're praying his will, even we pray for his will that I don't have this cold. Well, if you're praying for this will, will that you don't have this cold so that you can go witness to this person, that's a little bit more in his will. And guess what? You still might not get rid of that cold, but he'll figure out a way that you can still witness to that person because it's his desire that they come to know him. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died. That's why Jesus rose again. To read the explanation though, and starting in verse 18, it says, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. That, that is the seed along the path. Okay? Non-believers. Well, I just said, is that you? Think about your hardened heart. Maybe you've never looked at this passage that way. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they, they last only a short time. When troubled or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Is that you? You may still be sitting here in church and everything, but you have been upset because God hasn't answered these things the way you wanted them in your life. He's not a vending machine. He's, why should he answer your prayers at all? But he chooses to answer them. He wants to answer them. God Almighty, why would he ever love us in the first place? But he chooses to. We sinned against God, but he still loves us. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to, to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. If that wasn't true in this country with the blessings that we have, 99% of people would be Christians, and I mean Christians, not say the word Christians, where the word Christian is associated with hypocrites. With abundance that we have, the media that we have, the technology that we have, the freedom that we have, the churches that we have, we have no excuse that people, that this place is not completely full and bulging at its seams. We have us to blame because we're not carrying our light to men the way that we should. We don't have Jesus as the center of our heart. We have Him in a portion of our heart. But the seed falling on good soil refers to some who hear the words and understand it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times that was shown. If you notice, and hopefully you did here, there's only one soil that produced a crop. Why would you plant something unless it was to produce a crop? The farmer, God, planted his word. Even his son, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you're not producing a crop, then you better seriously think about that today and ask God why you're not. Because it's what we're called to do. I don't mean to be offensive. I mean to be your pastor and guide you. And sometimes you have to take the staff and pull the sheep back because he's getting a little further away from the safety of the herd. Sometimes you need to take the rod and, and give him a little knock. And I'm not pointing any fingers because like I said, I'm going to give God as much as I can give him today and start off afresh because I do value what he did for me by sending his son to die for me. I do want his blessings. I do want to live a life worthy, not a life that's worthless. No other soil should be an option in a believer's life. Does that mean we're going to get weeds? Yes, but let Jesus pick them. Does that mean we're going to have our heart hardened sometimes? Yes, but let him soften it. Let him take a little trial or a hoe, or if it takes a Troy-built tiller, let him use it. But he's not going to use it if you don't allow him and you don't want it in your life. That's one thing he's not going to do. If he needs to give you more soul and put, remove some rocks, 
He will if you ask Him. So I ask you today how the soil is in your life. I'm going to read another passage. Matthew 7, 21 we read earlier that said, Lord, Lord, those that come to Him, and He says, depart from me, I do not know you. Well, let's read up to that point. In verse 15 it says, Watch out for false prophets. Well, I don't, I'm not a false prophet. I don't want to be put there. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. If you're not a sheep, you're not a sheep. That means you're an imposter, period. Whether it's a wolf or a goat or whatever it is, you're not a sheep. Sheep know, him, know the shepherd by his voice, and they follow only his voice. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from, the bush, from, from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, you can count it the same way, every good tree bears good fruit. Are you producing a crop? When God planted the seed, the farmer planted the seed, it was for the purpose of producing a crop or fruit. But a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them, whether they are sincere, whether they are Christians, believers, whatever word you want to use, saved, born again, or whether they're imitators. And I say this because I don't know who is and who isn't. But my prayer, my concern is being the shepherd of this church, being the pastor, is that all of us are saved that come here. And not only saved, but that we are producing fruit. I don't want you to live a life where you've got fire insurance and you make it to heaven. I want you to live a worthy life because it's what the Bible says. It's Jesus' words. That we live a life of worth. And hopefully, like I said, we'll see in this lifetime the fruits of that. We'll see the people that come to Jesus Christ. But even if we don't, we're still being obedient to our Father. Do you know what the sin of commission is? It's when we willfully do sin, do wrong. But I think so many times we're guilty more of the sin of omission, of not doing what we know that we should be doing. We're not doing the wrong things. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. But are you guilty of omission because you're not giving it all to God? You're not taking up your cross daily and following after Him. You're not producing fruit. That's the sin of omission. James 4, 17 says, If anyone then who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. That's how the Bible puts what I was trying to say. John the Baptist started his public ministry with repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus started his ministry with repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John went on to say in Matthew 3, 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Fruit, fruit, fruit. Seed sown for a crop. It only makes sense. God would not plant seed for it to do nothing. If you are a Christian, you must produce fruit. That means it doesn't rely on me. It relies on me giving it to Him. Because I can't produce the fruit. I am not worthy. I don't have the abilities or the might or the courage or the strength or anything else. But He gives me exactly what I need when I need it. That's why Steve and I were talking at the beginning. How can these people who their children are murdered in a church and so forth, how can they come back and preach grace, grace, grace? Because God gives them what they need to walk through that in their lives. They're more than likely genuine believers because how could they walk through it otherwise? Their, their roots would be burnt up, wouldn't they? And I'm sure they fought and struggled with this. But the, way, the only way they're going to get through it is to give more and more to God and say, take this burden from me because I can't bear it. So that they can get those weeds and the rocks out, get the soil that they need to produce fruit. Luke 13, 1 through 5 says, Now there were some present at, at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. We don't know what they did. We just know this is a current event. But Jesus says, 
But unless you repent, you too will also perish. Or how about those 18 who died in the power of Siloam when it fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you change your ways of thinking. You start being doers of the word, not hearers only. You let him cultivate your heart so that there can be effective growth and a, pr a crop produced. You too might perish. So many times it's a lot easier for me to get up here and say these feel-good things. But I have a responsibility also to tell you Jesus' words. He was offensive. He got crucified for it. And if I'm offensive and it saves someone's soul, then so be it. Because it saves someone's soul. And that's our job. That's why we're supposed to produce a crop. <clears throat> 2 Peter 3, verse 9 through 11 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. Wow. Thank, thank the Lord. Why? He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire in the earth, and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. In Luke 13, Jesus told another parable about a farmer. In verse 6, it says, A man, the farmer, had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went out to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vine vineyard, We've already seen that the farmer was God. So the man who took care of the vineyard, who took care of all of our problems, who bore them on his shoulders at the cross, and who says, who gives them to, give them to me now and I'll bear them, because he faced everything that we can possibly face as a human being, and he lived a perfect life to take our place. He says, um, for th he said, to, for, first is here's what the farmer said, sorry. For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on the fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up what? Soil. Sir, the man replied, Jesus, our advocate, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. Will you let him do that? If it bears more fruit next year, fine, because that's what it's supposed to do. The farmer has the tree that produces figs, which it was designed to do. If not, cut it down. It's 2017, and Jesus is digging today, January 1st, as He's digging any other day, trying to cultivate your heart, trying to get you to see how good and gracious that God is, how much that He loves you, how much that He wants to bless you. We're children of God. We will spend eternity with Him. Why would we not want to start living that way today? Why would we not want to bring Him glory and honor? Will you give your heart to Jesus today and let Him do what He needs to do with it? Will you examine your heart and give Him the things that you need to give Him? Father, we do thank You so much for the love that You have given us that you didn't give up on us, that you are true, you are perfect, you are patient, you are kind, and I could go on and on and on. I, I don't understand why. It boggles my mind that you are so gracious and loving, that we sinned against you, and you said, I'll send my son and let him die in your place. Wow. Lord, help me to see the things in my life that I do need to set right. Help me to give them to Jesus, Lord. And I know He'll take care of every one. I know that Satan will probably attack more, so I, I ask you for more grace, for more power from your Spirit. To see the power of the seed of the Word of God, to see the power of the Spirit of, that God lives inside of me, that I have nothing to worry about, that I love, I love others, 
I love you because you first loved us and you showed what love is really like. Lord, take what I have to offer. It's not much, but take my heart. And Father, I pray that you are dealing with those today that need things dealt with in their life so that they can become more like Christ. It is what we're called to do, to be like our teacher, our master, our Lord. We thank you for the example that he gave, the obedience that he had to the Father, that he lived out not his will as a human being, but, you, but your will, Father, so that men could be reconciled to God. We thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all praise and we thank you and praise you for the Lamb who was slain for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you look in your bulletins, there's a little cartoon figure where this guy has his little heart and he says, and I don't, I'm paraphrasing it, but he says, this is all I have. And there's a voice coming down from above, from God, that says, that's all I ever wanted. And that is all that God ever wants. He wants you. He wanted you so much that He sent Jesus to die for you. I'm echoing. So we're going to take communion. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29, the Lord Jesus on the night He was betrayed took bread and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup saying, This cup of the new covenant in my... It, the, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the, this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But Paul goes on to say because there's problems there and because people don't realize what we're doing when we're remembering this. This is a sacred thing that we're doing, that we remember how much God loved us, that he gave Jesus for us. So he goes on to say, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in any unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. So now you've got scripture again. You've not just got me saying examine your hearts. You've got God's Word saying, examine your hearts. Jesus is sitting there saying, will you let me fully in? I'm standing at the door and knocking. Will you let me into your heart? Will you let me have control? And the things that I can show you, you're going to be amazed with. So I'm going to play a video while we're doing communion so we can all partake in it. While the video is playing, not yet. We'll pass out the elements first. Be thinking about how much God loves you, what He has done for you, that He loves you so desperately, and no matter what you do, no matter what you did, He's saying, please, please come to me, my child. <coughs> We're going to pass out um, the elements, hold on to them. When the video's all done and everything, we'll all take together. John, will you help me? body broken for you. You don't have to partake either. It's totally up to you. This is between you and God. This isn't between me. It's not for someone else to see. It's simply where you are with God and how you feel about what God has done for you. That's why we take it in remembrance so that we don't forget that we sit here and contemplate when we do this how much Jesus did for us. Pass it on, get on from the other end. I got him all down.
The cups represent the blood of Jesus Christ, which was poured out for us. The blood that ran red so that our sins could be washed white. So that we don't have to do anything because we can't in the first place. Jesus was the perfect, acceptable sacrifice for all sin of all mankind for all time. Jacob, will you start the video?